started here and it just kept ripping out just like in that animation we just saw. And the big, you know, fascination here, and it kind of says it here, is it means that these systems are non-conservative. I mean, you know, people in the audience probably remember doing balanced cross-sections and trying to put faults back together. You can't do this in the oceans because, you know, this thing didn't even exist when this part of the fault was moving. And I'm sorry, I should have clicked onto this before, but here is a cross-section to help maybe understand this thing better. This is the so-called breakaway. So this is a cross-section through the middle of this thing. Here's a breakaway, and then here we are going over the surface of the Earth and descending into the mantle. Here's the ridge. And so all these lines are corrugations on that fault surface. And so the point is, you know, that's so big. I mean, you can kind of do it in your head. Push it back together. All this stuff down here, you know, 125 kilometers in the mantle didn't exist when the first part of the fault was, was moving. And I find that fascinating, and I always try and sell that to my grad students, you know, when they start this thing, this kind of research. So just to give you a feel for how big it is, here's part of the world you all know and love. Here's Jackson, and here's um, uh, Pocatello, and here, basically, is a whole bunch of baseline range normal faults. Now let's just superimpose Godzilla at the same scale. And so here's Godzilla. And so remember, that's one single fault surface, 125 kilometers. And the, you know, the point being is it can't stick 125 kilometers up in the air because it has no strength, so it rolls over and it becomes horizontal. But it just gives you a feel for how big these things are. And remember, 20 years ago, we didn't know these existed. And here's just another picture, and I'll quickly stick on something you all know and love, there's the Tetons. But here's another picture from the Atlantic. This is one that, that Bobby's worked on. You know, again, here is one of these detachment faults. You see these corrugations? This is literally where it's ripping out of the ridge axis and it's moving in that direction. And the bottom line of this, and you see the reference on this 2016, you know, we're still trying to understand how these things work. But two insights. Earlier I said, well, why do we get these things? And in truth, we don't totally know. Um, but this was a piece of work, and I apologize for the graphic, but the, you know, the paper is just one of the, it's a mathematical paper where there's no vivid pictures. But it was work done by Roger Buck at Columbia University. And he just produced a model, which was this. And so what you're looking at here is two pieces of the lithosphere being pulled apart. And then you can either well, you can put magma up the middle to fill the crack, as we discussed earlier, or you can have a fault and allow these things to extend. And he just simply did the mathematical calculation to say, OK, let's say we're pulling this apart, and let's make up some numbers here. Let's say we're pulling it apart at 2 centimeters a year this way and 2 centimeters a year that way. If, so its total extension is 4. If we're only putting in the equivalent of 2 centimeters of magma, and it means this part moves apart without any faults, and this side has to have a fault to move apart. And you know, he argued, if you've got this, and it says it up there, this Goldilocks balance between the amount of magma you're producing at the ridge and the amount of extension, you can stabilize these faults to form these single continuous faults. And that's basically the best idea we've got at the moment. There's some magical balance between the amount of magma coming in and the amount of extension, and you can just set up that balance correctly that rather than busting new faults, you just have one fault that just keeps going for 120 kilometers. So that's how we think they form. And here's another little animation. This came out of the same sort of work. Um, just to show you, and we'll run it a couple of times, the picture to look at is the one at the top. It's just showing you strain, and these red lines are the faults. So really what's going on here is people tried to make models of how this work. And I'll run it again after I just talk a few seconds. Remember, the red is high strain zone, so think of the red as faults. When this thing starts, you'll see a single fault grow in this direction, 
and you'll see it come apart. And then it goes, kind of goes more crazy and get faults all over the place. And this is kind of what we think happens at these slow spreading ridges. So let's just watch that again. Watch the single fault form. Didn't get it. There it goes. Oops. Go back. There we go. There, so you saw the single fault and then it goes crazy and you basically get multiple faults and so on and so forth. But this is, you know, an idea of what we think is happening at slow spreading ridges. Let's quickly ask the opposite question, and I think this is fascinating too, is well, why does it stop? You know, 125 kilometers, why didn't it go to 150 kilometers or 200 kilometers? And this actually comes out of some work we've done. And the fun thing is, it looks like these things are destined always to kill themselves. And I'll explain why in a minute. Here is um, the mid Cayman rise again, this little ridge in the Caribbean Ocean. And here is the bathymetry we collected with the ship again. And what you're looking at is three different oceanic core complexes, three different detachment faults. Here's Mount Dent that we looked at earlier, the one we compared to Mount Everest. Here's an older one, Mount Ems, which is dissected by faults. And here's Mount Hudson in the south. And this is the whole length of the ridge axis. That's all there is to it. And there's just these three core complexes. And if you look carefully at this one, you know, it's got a, like a big valley going through the end of it. And what we think this is, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute, this is the thing being decapitated and this is how they end. And so let's look at the next slide. Here's just a side on perspective, looking at that same picture. So here's Mount Hudson, the one in the south. Here's Mount Dent, here's Mount Ems. If you look at this carefully, you can actually see another feature coming through here, going up here, there's a ridge. And you see that ridge coming through and then you see these lines up here. These are faults in Mount Dent. This actually is a volcanic ridge, which is cutting through the middle of this feature. And basically that's where the spreading and the volcanism is occurring. And so what you're seeing here is the ridge cut through the middle of this one and has split it apart. It's in the process of cutting through this one now, you see the faults forming. And guess what? That's where the hydrothermal activity is, which Bobby will talk about tomorrow. And so you're seeing in these three core complexes, three different stages or ages of destruction. This is the old one, which is dead, which has been destroyed. This one was recently decapitated, but you can still see it. And this one is in the process, because what we're saying is in time, you'll get spreading along this ridge and this thing will simply get cutting off. And you could say to me, well, how does that work? Why, why is it doing that? Um, I'm sorry, before we get there, here's just a zoom in of Mount Hudson. And what you can look at, see is here's the volcanic ridge. You actually see the volcanoes. These are the volcanoes on that volcanic ridge that's going through the middle there. And so why is this happening? Well, sorry, I'll get there in a minute. <laughs> Just to point out that that's you know, not just an anomaly, here is five degrees south on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Here's another example of exactly the same phenomenon. Here's the core complex, see the corrugations perpendicular to the ridge axis. Here's the toe of the core complex. This thing has been split apart. So it looks like the end of these things happen basically by splitting them apart. The question is why, and it turns out and this is a bunch of work that we've mostly done. Here are a whole bunch of different detachment faults core complexes. And what this picture is trying to show you is basically whether the spreading is symmetric or asymmetric. And so the way to think about this picture, I mean, forget about the colors, but here is the zero line. If it was symmetric spreading, the bar would be an equal length on both sides. And so if you look at this picture, all these bars are heavily weighted to, to one side, which is the detachment fault side. And here is some numbers. And so in every one of those cases, something like from a low of 68 to a high of maybe 100, 68 to 100% of the spreading is occurring on one side of the ridge. The other side of the ridge just sits there, and the other, all the extension is on the other side. And what this means, if you actually draw a bunch of cartoons, so let's just go through this. 
Here's a little map, here's the ridge axis, here's a bunch of faults, here's a little cross-section bunch of faults. So what we've just said is, you know, a core complex, these detachment faults, when one of these little faults starts to go a little crazy, starts to move a lot. So here it is growing, here it is growing more in the third picture. But we've also said the spreading's asymmetric. And so what it means is, you know, effectively, this fault is going to have to migrate, migrate across where the magma is coming to the surface. And so it's this asymmetry. If we look at these pictures, we start here, it's growing, it's moving in that direction, but because it's asymmetry, it's actually moving across the locus of magmatic activity. And so it just seems a natural phenomenal to, phenomenon to these things that eventually they'll always destroy themselves because they're asymmetric and they migrate across the ridge axis and sooner or later, you know, they get decapitated and you get the toe on one side and the rest on the other. So that appears to be what is happening. Okay, enough of slow spreading ridges. Let's quickly go to the cruise that we went on that some of you might have heard us broadcast from, which was a year and a half ago. And we were lucky enough to go to Easter Island. And now we're gonna look at fast spread crust. And so why did we go out to Easter Island? We went to Easter Island because Easter Island was near this place, which is called Pedo Deep, which is another big hole in the, in the oceans. So the bottom of this hole is something like six kilometers. You've got something like six kilometers of vertical relief here. What it gives you is a cross section through oceanic crust. So if you want to understand how oceanic crust is growing, you know, let's try and find a place in the world where we can collect rocks all the way through that section and basically um, then try and understand how it works. And that's why we went there. And here it is on a map. This is where Pedo Deep is. Um, Easter Island is just down here, just to the southeast of Pedo Deep. And what it is, is it's on a little microplate. So here's the East Pacific rice. And then there's a little microplate in here, which is just spinning like a cork. And as it spins, it's basically generating a bunch of faults along the outside and you can actually see into the crust. And this is, you know, what we were up to. Here's a cross section through the crust. Here's the mantle. You know, it's a place in the world which is, and these places are very rare, where we can go and collect rocks through the top couple of kilometers in the crust. And we wanted this yellow stuff, the gabbros, which really have r rarely been sampled in the oceans. And to show you a picture of what it's probably like, this is the corner of the Easter microplate. And, you know, I'd say it's spinning around there, it's pulling the crust apart, and you're getting these fault scarps, which will allow, allow you these cross sections through the crust. So that's why we went there. And we went there because we're trying to, you know, test these sorts of models. And so these are very much straw man models, but it shows you, it gives you an idea of our state of knowledge about how we form this stuff. And remember my point earlier, I was arguing that 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by oceans. So something like 60% is made of ocean crust and we really don't understand how it forms. We're still arguing over big picture models like this. And here are the two end member models. One model says all the melt from the mantle goes to the top in this melt lens, and then the crystals flow away like a glacier. It's called the Gabbro Glacier Flow Model. So all the melt goes to the top, forms crystals on the bottom of this melt lens, and then they flow away like a glacier, and that's how we build ocean crust. The alternative model is you don't have this at all, you just intrude sills, bodies of melt at different depths, and you just keep doing this and you eventually fill the hole. These are straw man models. We pretty much know today neither is totally correct, but it just gives you an idea of our state of knowledge. We're still playing these games. We really don't understand how it really works. And so what we were up to was to try and collect a bunch of rocks to test these models. And so this was a picture we actually had in the proposal. The idea is on this side is the multiple sill model. We're injecting a bunch of sills. On this side, the Gabriel Glacier flow model. We're flowing the crystal mush. And then, and we don't have to go through these in detail, but here are a bunch of predictions. And, you know, for example, let's look at the green line. The green line is a prediction of composition with depth. So in the multiple sill model, you'd predict 
you know, increasing MGO content with depth, whereas in the Gabbro glacier flow model, you predict constant composition with depth. So this was our pitch. You know, let's go and collect some of these rocks in situ, make some analyses, calculate cooling rates, compositions, and so on, and see if we can test these two models. So what did we find? Well, here is our major area. We saw this earlier. This is the one that we put next to El Capitan. And all these color spots are all our samples, and they're actually color coded by composition. So the first thing we found was amazing variation and lateral variation. So the ridge axis is over here to the left. So imagine we're just looking along a flow line. And so we got all these blue things, which are olivine rich rocks. They're really quite primitive. They're things called troctolites, if anybody in the audience knows that word. But they're made of olivine um, and a little bit of plagioclase and not much pyroxene. And these are, you know, bona fide a gabbro, ordinary gabbros with nowhere near as much olivine as these things. So the first thing we found, which was a complete surprise, is this big lateral variation from light blue to dark blue. And then other things on here, these are what we call oxide gabbros. This al almost certainly is that melt lens, that red lens we saw in the earlier picture. And here are these orange cubes are the sheeted dikes that are on top of the gabbros. And if we just put an overlay over on there, there we are. First of all, show you what the rocks look like on the seafloor. They're beautifully layered. See these layers of light and dark, more and less plagioclase. Here's a big pegmatitic zone in the bunch of layers over here. And here's that picture annotated. And so what we mapped was something like about a thousand meters of the top of the gabbros. Below here, it's just scree, so we could, didn't get any more rocks. Here's the transition between the dikes and the gabbros. And here's this big change from olivine gabbros to troclites. So from less olivine to more olivine traveling laterally. And here's some preliminary data. Oh, no, sorry. This is just to show you what's going on. One of our graduate students, Michelle Guess, is actually trying to analyze the olivine and plagioclase compositions on here. And I know you can't read it, but we'll just be here for a second. Is all the um, purple diamonds of where we've measured plagioclase compositions, all the black diamonds of where we measured olivine compositions, all the red dots are all our samples. And you know we've got something like 350 samples here. And we're just trying to work through and just get a, a detailed picture of this part of the crust. And this probably is the most detailed mapping that's ever been done of in situ oceanic gabbros. So to look at some of Michelle's data just very quickly, the remarkable thing, but it just fits with that picture. So here's depth. So sheeted dikes up there going deeper down here. Here's basically olivine composition. And I put this line on here because I think it's great fun. This is basically the line between the dark blue dots and the light blue dots. And so here is a chemistry plot, but I can put a line on here, which is west and east. And the point is those gabbros, this is what the gabbros are doing. They have olivines with four strike contents of 80 and then evolving up to four strike contents of 67. And those troctolites basically have a constant composition of something like 85. And so here's the remarkable result, or this, the simplest interpretation of that. If we put back that picture we had at the start, remember we said we collect data to test these curves. Well, let's concentrate on the green ones again. In the sheeted sill model, we made the prediction that composition would basically become more Mg rich or more Fo rich with depth which is what we saw here. And in the Gabbro Glacier Flow model, we made the prediction that composition would be basically constant, which we see here. So guess what? We get to make everybody happy because we can say both models apply. And you're just seeing this remarkable change over 100 meters from growing oceanic crust like this to growing oceanic crust like that. So you know, this is work that's really going on now. Um, here's some interim results. Those dark blue colors, the, the olivine-rich troctolites, having them near the dike gabbro transition was really a big discovery. That's not been seen before. Um, we didn't talk much about it, but the layering you saw in the pictures tends to be very complicated. We're seeing this lateral variation, and you know, so do both of those models apply. Now, the only way we're going to ground test this stuff is to go to places like Oman. And you say to me, well, what's Oman? Oman 
has the best ophiolite in the world. And an ophiolite is a piece of oceanic crust that tectonically has been pushed on the land surface. And so to ground truth a lot of this stuff or to extrapolate it, because it is so expensive and so difficult to go to the bottom of the oceans, let's actually go to the continents where we've got a piece of oceanic crust and do that in more detail. And there's a big project going on at the moment, the Oman drilling project, where people have been drilling holes into Oman. And, you know, it's going to be hard to see this picture, but what we tried to do here is here's some published work on Oman from 2009, you know, with different depths. So this is 50 to 200 meters below the dikes, 150 to 300 meters, different pictures of thin sections. Here's the rocks we're seeing at Pito. You can kind of match them one to one. And that's comforting because some people will always turn around and say, well, ophiolites are not real oceanic crust. So if we can kind of ground truth the top of Oman to Pito, then maybe we can use the bottom of Oman to give us the stuff that we can't get to at Pito Deep. And literally, this is a picture that I finished um, two weeks ago actually. Um, I was just come back from Japan. We were on uh, a ship in Japan logging all this stuff. And what you're looking at here is the cross mantle boundary in, o in Oman. And one of the holy grails in, in geology since the, 60s, since the 60s has been to drill basically through the mantle. And, you know, we can, we just about have the technology to do it, but it would cost billions of dollars. But why not go on land somewhere like this where we can drill 300 meter and 400 meter holes and do the same thing? And what you're looking at here are two drill holes, one 400, one 300, literally across the cross mantle boundary. The blues are gabbros. The, this green color here is predominantly dunite, so nearly 100% olivine. And then here is kind of sort of bony fide mantle down here with all the complications you can see in these rocks. And so I was fortunate, and I think it was a privilege to be able to log this core, which was 400 meters, which went through the Gabros, which crossed the cross mantle boundary. And I'm going to, well, I'm going to skip this picture apart from one thing. So what really I'm, you know, pushing here is Pito <coughs> gives us this stuff, but because of scree and that, it's hard to get deeper than that. And so these three orange, uh, sorry, yellow boxes indicate areas where we've drilled this stuff in Oman. And so one of the projects we're putting, we're trying to do now is put this all together to try and understand the whole thing. And we'll forget the cycles for now. And I'll just click through those. And I'll show you the grail. That is what the moho looks like in Oman. What you're looking at there is these are gabbros. And this is this dunite, which has now been serpentinized. So this rock was once nearly 100% olivine. This rock was gabbro, so you can see relic foliation, these yellow lines. And what you're actually looking at is that boundary. And so this black stuff below here goes on for about 150 meters. And so this is the thing that is giving you that moho refraction in Oman. The only thing wrong as if you look, you see the arrows there, that this is a piece of bore core. So actually, it was, its real orientation is like that. And it just so happens where they put the borehole is they hit a fault. And so what you're actually looking at here, all this, these white lines here are the foliation in the fault material. And we can zoom in and look at a thin section. Here's a thin section. Oops, too far, go back. Here's that thin section. And what you're actually looking at there is it's a cataclysite. These are, it's, it turned out, and it's just the bad luck, is that a boundary in that hole is actually a fault contact. So that was a bit of a shame. <coughs> to finish off, a couple of little things. Um, this is a little bit of an introduction to Bobby's talk tomorrow. Bobby's going to talk about hydrothermal vents and the life that live on hydrothermal vents. And, you know, in some ways, geology can be pretty boring. You know, rocks, they're not that exciting. But the other part of this whole shebang is, you, again, in going to places you've never been before, you actually find creatures that you've never seen before. I mean, again, we know so little about the oceans that there are many animals down there that nobody has ever seen. Now, maybe not like the Meg, if anybody's been to the movies, but... <laughs> 
um, nevertheless much smaller animals. And this was a, a cruise I was on a few years ago, and this is the Okeanos Explorer, that NOAA ship I mentioned. And the whole idea of this ship is, is so-called telepresence, is you only have two scientists on the ship, and we're basically DJs. We're just commenting on what's going on, but through telepresence, through satellites and beaming around the world, you've got scientists and the public just watching what's going on and, and two-way talking and so on and so forth. And here's all the dives we kind of did, and I kind of like this a news group called, um, I, I'll have to introduce it, I'm not supposed to speak when it plays. A news group co called Quartz made this 90 second video and you'll hear me and the other co-chief uh, co scientist on the cruise. We're able to be in contact with up to 40 scientists a day. We also have an internet chat room. Mike just typed in, this, this sunburst creature blew my mind. Um, I mean, Mike, you're the expert. I mean, did we really see something completely new there? So scientists from all over the country and at times all over the world will log into the chat room and we discuss our observations as we're going. So what this really does is it allows us to engage people that have expertise in marine geology, in oceanography, in taxonomy, so they'll be a starfish expert or a jellyfish expert or coral expert, and so they're all working with us together, which you know is very unique. Other research expeditions, you only have a certain number of bunks on the ship. A lot of stuff we saw, a lot of animals that we saw, you know, were really unfamiliar to a lot of experts back then. Short, so the goals are to hopefully come back and collect a few specimens and. I'm sure there are many, many more new species to be described. Now, Andrea, my co-chief scientist, is much better at this than me. If that's get the right button. And so just to finish off that little segment, here is one of those creatures that nobody had ever seen before. You saw it in the video. Um, this is a little jellyfish. You know, this is the description that was made. And this is what the thing is called. Um, but, you know, it just gives you an idea that, that there are these things to be found. You know, it's tiny. It's not the mag. It's only six centimeters long. But this um, creature had never been seen before. To finish off, one of the cool things in doing this research is it provides opportunities. And so, you know, being at the University of Wyoming means that we can take students. These were some of the Wyoming students that came with us on that pedo cruise. Michelle was an undergraduate at the time. These were graduate students, Drew, Chris, and Tanner. Um, Michelle now is, is doing a master's with us, with us and working on the chemistry. Um, but, you know, it's one of the fun things is bringing young people with us and teaching them about all this stuff. And the last thing I want to just show you is a little bit of outreach we did, which was kind of cool, or I think cool, forgive me, um, is this is a bunch of middle school kids with their teacher, Teresa Williams, at the UW Lab School. And what we did is we bought them this kit, and they basically made this boat, which is a drifter with a GPS. It's about, well, you can see the scale from the picture. Um, and they painted it, and they named it, and they called it the Jackalope, and they made the... Um, the, the sail and so on and so forth. And then we took it with us and we launched it. And in some ways it was following, you know, many of you might remember the Contiki expedition. You know, it followed the direction of the Contiki expedition. And in the end, this thing traveled 2,200 miles. And, you know, the deal is that basically it, the GPS reported in every day. So the kids could, could watch where it went to every day and check it up and learn about the oceans and so on and so forth. And it had a grand old time. It, you know, as you, as you can imagine, as you come out of here, you start to get lots of islands. And the thing was slaloming around islands and we'd look every day and so on and so forth. And, you know, it went for 79 days. And then all of a sudden it did a right-hand turn and it basically, this is where it stopped. It made it to a place, we'll see it in the next picture, called the Java Rontong Plateau. 
you know, what you're seeing here, I mean, I learned a lot about the oceans, these little twirls so when a storm comes in, storms come through, it does a circle and then it carries on with the currents. You know, it slalomed through all these things, it was going up, we were hoping it would go all the way, and then suddenly it did a right-hand turn and landed on a beach, and it landed on um, this place, Java, on Tong Plat Plat Atoll, which happens to be the biggest atoll in the world. And you can see it just kind of went like this. And some fishermen found it and actually gutted it. But what we didn't know is people in, um, to the, in the Solomon Islands to the south, so if I actually just go back, so people in here were watching as well. And so they went and got it. And so we got an email in September after the thing had been dead for many months, which showed us a picture of the newspapers in, um, in the Solomon Islands. And this teacher, George Kaola, who grew up on Ontong Java, basically went and got it. And so here's pictures of the, of the jackalope after it did its 2,900 mile survey. And at the moment, we're actually going to send them a new GPS because the GPS was ripped out by the fishermen and a new sail, and they're going to put it back in the water. Wow. And that is basically it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Uh, you say the plates are pulling apart. Yeah. Good, good questions. And actually, you know, another one of these questions which has a simple answer and a much more complicated answer. We can pretty much demonstrate that the, the biggest source of the plates going apart is the subducting slabs. So the fact that in the Pacific, so the reason the Pacific is the fastest spreading crust is because it's got all those big subducting slabs all the way around the Pacific. And so you can do force balance calculations. The weight of that slab going down in the mantle is what's pulling them apart at a very fast rate. Now, you can hit me back and say, well, what about the Atlantic? There's no subducting slabs. And so in a way, that's partly why it's slower. There isn't any big subducting slabs to do it. And then those other forces come in, as you said. So the so-called ridge push, which is because the ridge sticks up in the air, the force due to the ridge sticking up in the air and coming down sideways is about an order of magnitude less than the subducting slabs, but it's still a force. And then, you know, arguably in some complicated way that we, it's hard to see, the moving mantle beneath the plates might, you know, as you said, be pulling along the bottom plates as well. So the simple story is nice. The fastest spreading plates match with the subducting slabs, and that's why they're the fastest. The stuff that we're on the fringe of is really understanding why the ones without slabs move at all. Okay, so we have subducting plates to pull in the ridge apart. Yeah. What's moving the plates? So gravity, effectively. But if the plate is high and, and higher than they can be maintained, being so the, yeah, so there's a force associated with the fact that the ridge, so typically the top of the ridge is three kilometers above the base of the seafloor. But it's that, that force, so the gravitational collapse of that three kilometers is still an order of magnitude less than simply the subducting slabs, which are going down 700 kilometers into the mantle. They're simply pulling the plates apart. So you, you Well, no, so, so the subducting slabs are more dense. You create this lithosphere, and it's more dense than the surrounding mantle. So they're going down because they're just that little bit more dense than the surrounding mantle, and then they're pulling the plates apart of the ridge. And that force is an order of magnitude greater than the gravitational collapse of the ridge, but there is still, you know, the, the, it must be in places like the Atlantic, that gravitational collapse of the ridge which is driving it because you've got no subducting slabs. In one of the first slides, you showed continental core complexes. Yeah. Are they related to these uh, ocean core complexes? Good question again. Um, you know, at some level, 
I mean, there's a specific definition of a continental core complex, which I'm going to mutilate and say, you know, the similarities is they both have these large offset faults. And Bobby worked for a th PhD thesis on these things. So if you go to the southern basin and range, you'll find these things in the continents. And, you know, again, you know, what we think they are are normal faults that have kind of gone crazy with large amounts of slip. And, you know, the point is they can't keep going up in the air because gravity gets them and they basically roll over. So at that level, they're very similar. But you've got the big differences that, you know, um, in the oceans, you're doing it at a mid-ocean ridge, you're doing it in a different composition crust, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, people play games about comparing and contrasting how similar they are. So at a simple level, they're very similar. They're big faults that have gone crazy. Um, but in detail, you know, are they, are they growing by the same mechanism? And people, you know, argue, debate, and so on and so forth. John. Mike, you talked about the low hole and uh, Mike tell people sure. what the low hole is and how deep it is below us here. Okay, sure. Here. So, um, you know, one of the, you know, the things that people have drawn on pictures now for many years is, is the boundary between the crust and the mantle. And so, basically, um, oceanic crust, and we know this because we've been and measured it, so that's the gabbros and the dikes and the basalts. Oceanic crust on average is about seven kilometers thick. Continental crust is a different composition. Oceanic crust is made of basalt and gabbros. It's made of mafic minerals, olivine, pyroxene, plagioclase. Continental crust is made of feldspar, quartz, and so on and so forth. Continental crust is built in a different way and on average is 40 kilometers thick. And so, you know, as an aside, I'll come back to John's question, is it was way back in the 60s that people, you know, came with the idea of, well, let's, let's see what's beneath crust. Let's go beneath this crust and find the so-called mantle underneath and see what it's like. And so even in the 60s, people were smart enough to say, hey, you know, it's going to take a lot to drill through 40 kilometers. Let's try and do it in the oceans. And so in the 60s, it was, it was really the start of the um, ocean drilling project. A, a Princeton professor, Harry Hess, got together a bunch of scientists and said, let's do the opposite to go into the moon. Because remember, the 60s were when we went to the moon. Let's see if we can go down and go into the mantle. And this was, you know, big science. They built a boat, which today is so primitive, but it was a unique boat. They got telegrams from Kennedy because it was just such high profile. But they got about 100 meters because it was so difficult. And in fact, the big advance that they made was actually, you know, if you're drilling in the oceans, you've got to kind of keep this, the ship steady if you've got this big drill string going down into the earth. And so the advance they made was actually the understanding how to dynamically position the ship to keep the ship stationary in the waves and the currents. And that was actually the big science that came out of it. But this project's been, you know, hanging around for since the 60s and people keep trying to, you know, come back to it. But that boundary between the crust and the mantle was basically first seen by seismologists. And it was, and it was recognized and it's just over 100 years ago. The anniversary is about 100 years. An um, um, uh, uh, Eastern European geophysicist called Morovicic did a seismic experiment and what he realized was you know seismic waves travel more slowly through the crust than they do through the mantle and there's a big velocity change there the top of the mantle seismic waves go through at eight kilometers a second in the crust seismic waves go through at about seven or something like that six to seven and so he was the first guy that recognized the cross mantle boundary. He did it geophysically and we named it after him. So Moho is short for Mahavishik, the guy that did it. And so this has, you know, been a grail for a long, long, long time. Um, you know, people still talk about drilling this, drilling the oceans. Um, we barely have the technology because the temperatures when you get seven kilometers down are going to start to get hot. You've got to think of the weight you've got potentially six kilometers of water plus the equivalent of seven kilometers of, of crust, you know, basically pressing down on your drill bit. 
we could probably do it, but it would cost billions and billions of dollars. And personally, and I probably shouldn't say this on live, I think we could spend the money on other things. So how far have they zeroed down for scientific purposes? In sure. The um, in the continents, the drip is academic hole that's ever been drilled was drilled by the Russians in the Kola Peninsula, so up there in the north. And I think, if I remember correctly, they got to 13 kilometers. And that's the deepest that's ever been drilled. Um, I might be wrong. It might only be nine kilometers. I forget. Does anybody know? But it's that sort of... Sorry, John? 38, 39, 40, yeah. Maybe a little more. Right. But that's the deepest one that's ever been drilled. In the oceans, um, again, you know, if you're an oil company, you're drilling um, for deep oil and you're drilling in sediments, that's not the most difficult thing to do. I don't know what the deepest one is, but several kilometers, right? Yeah, it's, I think the Russian one was actually more like 45 thousand feet. Right. I think the deepest well we drilled was probably like 8,000 Right, okay, right. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, but just quickly to finish that off. So, that's why we play with what we call these tectonic windows. You know, a lot of what I was talking about has a big fault, right? So, if nature has ripped the top off, then you can be halfway there before you start. And the deepest hole that's ever been drilled in the oceans into crystalline basement is 1.5 kilometers. <laughs> well, so yeah, so that's part of the problem, you know, if, and actually, you know, uh, you know, as a side, the, the Japanese community are very keen on this. The, they, the, the, the company that staffs their drill ship is actually called Mantle Quest. And it is one of their big objectives. And almost certainly in the next five years, they will set up shop in Hawaii or set up offices in Hawaii, and they basically will take their ship there and basically start to preliminarily try to do this, um, i.e. drilling off the coast of Hawaii is arguably a better place to do it. Because so much comes into it. You could say, why Hawaii? Well, one of the simplest things is you don't want to be millions away, miles away from land, because you've got to get the ship there and back. But as you know, John said, you know, it is the thing that's going to cost billions of dollars and take tens and tens of years. And, you know, my biggest, my three objections are one, cost. I mean, it would be a fabulous thing to do, but it will cost so much money. Second thing is it will take a lot longer than I'm alive, and I don't want to miss it, so I'm against it. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it will take tens of years because it will, you know, so to give you an idea, and, you know, typically on a two-month drilling leg, you're lucky if you drill one kilometer, and you're, you're doing the easy bit because you're doing the surface bit. It gets slower, and, you know. Um, and then the third question, and I kind of indirectly, you know, pointed out in the talk, and that is, okay, let's say we do get a hole, and it would be fabulous, you know, we'd learn a lot, but it's still a one-dimensional hole. Just think of the lateral variation I showed you at pitot deep. If we drilled on the left-hand side, we get a completely different answer than we drilled on the right-hand side. So at the end of the day, if you put all that together, is it worth that investment of time? And then the last thing is, the thing about drilling is if something goes wrong, the only thing to do is to start again. And so we know from the drilling that we've done, where we've drilled crystalline rocks, you know, we are on the fringes of technology. And drill strings break. You know, the ship gets hit by a big wave, you know, and the, then the ship goes up and the drill string doesn't, so it snaps. And that's what happened to a cruise that Bobby was on in, in, in the oceans. Yet to that point, you've now got, you know, 500 meters of drill string in your hole. 900 meters. <laughs> and the only thing to do is to start again. So. The risk is enormous as well. So the cost is high, the risk is enormous, and at the end of the day, you get a one-dimensional section. I think we would learn a lot, lot more by spending more time in somewhere like Oman or trying to piece it together by doing more accessible places.
is there some arbitrariness to this? Or? Good question. So um, a, a simple answer um, is simply oceanic lithosphere is more dense than continental lithosphere. So we, you know, if, you know, in our, so oh, let's go back two steps. We have plate tectonics as a mechanism to cool down the Earth. When the Earth ultimately cools down, there'll be no more plate tectonics. That's why there's no plate tectonics on Mars. Okay. So it is a manifestation of convection, of getting heat out of the Earth. And that heat is coming up the mid-ocean ridges. Now, it turns out that you know, ocean crust and the, the lithosphere below it is more dense than continental lithosphere. So if you've got this circuitry going, that's the stuff that's going to be subducted and not the continental lithosphere. Now, the next question, which is my, you might be asking, comes back to, well, you know, where does subduction start? I mean, how do we start it? Why? Where, where, why is it starting here? Yeah, exactly. Here? Some of them are in mid-ocean bases. Some of them are in margins. Sure. And so, again, I'm not sure we, we absolutely totally know. Um, again, ultimately, a big player is density. So as you go away from the ridge, the, the lithosphere is cooling and getting more and more and more and more and more dense. So, you know, there'll be a, you know, so people hypothesize that you know, you've got the ridge in the middle, you, you know, it's hot because the mantle's coming up, it's buoyant as you go further and further away, it's becoming more and more dense. And so, you know, you've got this unstable system, it wants to go down somewhere where better to break than at this boundary between the buoyant continents and the old dense oceanic lithosphere. Some of these are mid-ocean. Sorry? Some, some yeah. And so, you know, but so people, I mean, I, it's not a field I know much about, but I think the arguments come down to ultimately, you know, old and there's a crack, if you're with me. And so in other words, you're pushing this stuff away, it's got to fail somewhere. So it's going to fail basically where the, uh, the ocean lithosphere has become old and dense, and then basically where there's some sort of, you know, some sort of discontinuity enough that that's the point where it's going to start to go. And the argument would be once it starts to go, then it just follows. But I think, I mean, it's not something that I've done any work on. Um, my guess is it's something that, you know, we largely are guessing about. One of the, yeah, no, I'll, I'll stay there. One quick thing I didn't answer, John, coming back to the Moho, just for people's interest, um, in Laramie, the, and I'll say Laramie because I know it, um, the crust is 40 kilometers thick. So in Laramie, um, you know, um, this, this Moho, this boundary between the crust and the mantle is at 40 kilometers. My guess is it must be about 40 kilometers here as well. But, you know, you know I'm not sure. And that's average. Um, and, you know, go to somewhere like the Himalayas, it's 80 kilometers, because in the Himalayas, you've basically just shoved two pieces of crust on top of each other. So, you know, one on top of the other is 40 plus 40 is, is 80, and that's what it is. And if you go to somewhere like the Basin and Range, you know, the Basin and Range, we're pulling the crust apart. So the Basin and Range is down to 30 to 25 kilometers in places, because you're just stretching it. Yellowstone has got, you know, the um, Yellowstone plume hotspot underneath it. Um, so crustal thickness is probably, you know, exactly the same, except, you know, the whole region, one of the reasons we're so high up is there's this big low density mantle plume that's basically pushing everything up. And I got myself in trouble last time I was here because somebody then said, well, do you believe in mantle plumes? And I guess the answer is, yeah, I kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Sure. So if there are no more questions, uh, tonight's chair protocol is a little bit different. <laughs> it's going to require some cooperation and uh, coordination. But basically about half the chairs get put away, and the rest have to be left here in an orderly, not chaotic fashion. So <laughs> in the middle. Right. In the middle. So the peripheries can migrate over to this wall and over to that wall. And of course the one